93.6 Global Radio's return to El Dorado with Dave James. Part four of this series is a catch-up with a lady who really is a star both on screen and off. Framboise Gomondi, it's hard to believe it's been 25 years since you played Isabel Le Duc. Yeah, I can't believe it's 25 years. I mean, it feels like it was, you know, two or three years ago when you when you wrote to me and said, you know, oh, we are celebrating, you know, the 25th birthday. I'm like, good Lord. You know, it's it's the images are still very vivid in my mind and all the feelings, all the setup and all the, you know, heartaches and, and the hard work. And so, yes, it's, it's, it's quite strange that it's 25 years. Before El Dorado, um, you were already an established actor in France. Yes. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? An, an English TV project in Spain with a French star. How did that happen? Uh, very weird, actually. It was, um, I got a phone call from my agent on the Friday saying, uh, would you like to go to work for the BBC? Uh, in Spain for a year. I said, of course not. Um, I got the casting on the Friday afternoon with Julia and Julia Smith, who said, you are absolutely lovely, but you're far too young. At the time, I was 32, I think, and the character was 40. And I, I replied, yes, I know, I'm, 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 I look very young, but I'm actually 38, and I was lying through my teeth. But what happened is that they were looking for a tennis player to do my husband. And they found one that was actually 40, but looked 30. So the couple with me worked, if you see what I mean. So on the Monday, I got a phone call saying, we need to see you again. Uh, And she said, oh, it's terrible. I really like you, but you really, really look so young. And then on the Wednesday, I received a phone call saying, you got the part. There you go. Bonjour. Bonjour. What can I get you? Well, it's my son's birthday today. Would it be possible for us to have a party here tonight? Did you have any input into what Isabel was going to be like as a character? Not at the beginning. Uh, as, as, as we went, yes, a bit. For example, the fact that she was a squash player was my idea because I was a squash player myself. And strangely enough, now it's my, my uh, main uh, activity um, as a squash reporter. Uh, so that was my idea. And, and uh, Tony loved it. But for most of the time, for the rest, no, not really. It was um, in the imagination. The only thing they probably did was at the time, my English was not as good as, you know, it, it, it became later. But so they were simplifying a bit the, um, the writing for us. That's, that's the only thing they did, I think. Isabel was flamboyant. She was very glamorous. Was she a lot, she was, of, yes. yeah. was she a lot of fun to play? Yes, she was. She was because she was, uh, apart, the only nice thing about Isabel, I found, was the love for her son. That's the only thing, uh, you know, I I worked a lot with characters and I was told that always to find something nice in people. So you make it human. And Isabel was absolutely mad about her son. And that's the only thing nice about her. All the rest, she was was a racist. She was pretentious. She was a snob. She she wasn't faithful. She had everything. <laughs> you know? So it was quite fun because I was I was doing a bit, you know, it was every time I was receiving a script, I was like, oh, my God, she doesn't. Oh, my God, she's not going to do that. And yes, of course she will. Je suis vraiment désolé. All sorts of domestic crises. Am I so very late? No, no. Are we picking Philippe up? Oh, dear. And now I have to apologize again. He can't come. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, a problem at the tennis club, a weekend school running late or something stupid. Do you mind? No, of course not. As you say, married couples are not Siamese twins. (laughs) My wife's working, Philippe's working, so why not? Good. So it was fun. It was really, you know, great fun to, to create her and and to go and, and find all those things that, you know, I'm probably not, <laughs> and, and, and really do um, a good job as an actress, which is what you, you want to be an actress for, is to create things that you are not. She had some very, very tender, emotional moments at times when we really saw a different side to her, didn't she? Yes, when she fell in love, yes. Yes. Um, that was very, very interesting uh, storyline, I thought. 
especially I mean there's there's one scene in particular which is my favorite scene of the whole of 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 the whole character. It's when uh, Hilary Crane, who's playing the mother of Stephen, um, so the lover of Isabel, comes and you know and 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 has have a go at has a go at her, saying you know they could have easily um, the the children could have easily lost their their father. And Isabel turns around and and she's in tears and says, well they haven't. I'm the one that's lost everything. Uh, and that was the only time I think that Isabel really showed how you know how sensitive she could be and probably didn't realize she could be as sensitive because she I don't think she had ever been in love before that really well I hope you're satisfied what? you do realize how close you came to breaking up his marriage I think he's totally able to do that on his own I know it's nothing more than a game to you a congenial way of passing the time what? I realize to you it's nothing more than a joke a joke you see me laughing? His marriage may have been going through a rocky patch, but there are children involved. And whilst you've been having your fun, you've been toying with someone else's emotion. Those children could easily have lost their father. They haven't. Not this time. If you must know, the only person who has lost anything is me. You, you played that beautifully. That's my favorite. I mean, you know, there's always one, when you, when you play a character, there's one day where everything works perfectly it's you you're not a, a, an extraordinary actress every time you know what i mean you you've got good days you've got bad days you've got days where you think oh this is really not something i want to remember but you've got sometimes when the magic strikes and uh, it's very funny because one of the friends of of john maynard and tony holland who uh, was jack or called jack one day said he didn't know me at the time said I remember a scene from Isabel. It was a scene where you were talking with an older lady and you were you were very upset because you just lost your, your lover. And so that man that didn't know me at the time remembers that scene, that same scene that I know was particularly good. And if I had one scene to go, you know, in my in my desert island, that would be the one. On the show, you had some, on screen, anyway, you had some great chemistry with the other characters. I wondered if that translated into friendship in the real world as well. Um, my real friend on the, side, you know, on the set was Faith, Faith Kent, the old bugger, uh, the old, you know, lady that was doing that, you know. She was the opposite. Uh, Faith was the opposite of of the character she was playing. She was, she was fun, she was interesting she was sensitive she was we had so much fun we actually um when we came back to uh, england i actually found her an agent because her lovely agent dropped her and i found her another agent and we actually did a play together uh she was an amazing woman she died a few years ago and that was very sad Mesdames et messieurs, Dama O'Heron, senoras et senores this i hope marks the start of an integrated community here in Los Barcos. There's no reason why people of different nationalities shouldn't live together in perfect harmony. We've only to look at the children to see how this is possible. Uh, for the other actors, they were keeping themselves to themselves, to be honest. There were very little, uh, very, very little um, interaction uh, outside the set. I was t spending more time with, uh, with the crew. Are you still in contact with anyone from the show now? Uh, apart from Daniel Lombard, uh, no, not, not, not now, no. Um, the only thing I have is Mervyn Cummings, who is one of the, 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 the directors that we are still friends on Facebook, and Philip Draycott as well. So to, again, you know, um, the, the crew more than the actors. I must just ask you, I Isabel's bright yellow car. Yes, Ladian, yes. Oh, my word. Whose idea was that? I have no idea, but it was fun, wasn't it? It was hilarious. <laughs> and it, was, it was very French. I mean, to be honest, you know, when I was younger, my first car was that car. Not It was actually green, which was even worse, I guess. But it was like a, a derivé, you know, it's like one of those from the Deux Chevaux, you know, is the same kind of, of, and you put like very little petrol and he runs and runs and runs and runs forever. So it was a, a student car, really. So I don't know who invented that thing, but I must say, it was quite fun to drive. There was a few scenes where I was supposed to stop at just, you know, on the mark and all that. It was quite fun. It was quite fun. I remember.
remember. I completely forgot about the car. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, when you were filming um, El Dorado, where were you actually living? I was living in a lovely little, well, they call urbanization, in Mijas La Nueva, which was a sort of, I had a lovely two-bedroom house. Other actors went for bigger, you know, houses and, and they were sharing, you know, to have a, like a, their own swimming pool and sort of lots, lots of space. I didn't. I just went for, for what was given to me with a lovely little garden. I was gardening a lot. And it was just below Mijas, which was a bit over Puerto So it was nearly on the, you know, it was not on the coast exactly, but just a bit higher. And it was very quiet. My dog was very happy. He was, you know, running everywhere, being the sheriff of Miras and Riva. He was, you know, barking every time there was a car that didn't belong. You know, it was a lovely, it was a lovely year for, for that. It was really nice. I had a lovely house. Um, I was renting a car, so I was quite um, independent. There was a squash club in, in Puerto that, uh, was uh, run by Franco that was running it at the time. So I was spending my days there, I was playing bridge with a with a friend of mine. Um, so it was quite, it was quite, you know, good times, really. And if you don't mind me uh, telling you a little anecdote, which I think is quite funny. Um, one day we were at the beginning of the shoot. Um, I was going to the hairdresser at Luhode because that was when we started. We were at that hairdresser. And I was limping because the day before I actually injured myself playing squash. And next to me is a lady, very, very attractive, very about 50, 55 at the time. And we started chatting. She said, oh, what happened to you? And, and I'm like, oh, I just injured myself playing squash. And she says, oh, that's quite funny because my, my, I play squash myself. Uh, I play tennis. I'm a member of uh, Wimbledon. But my daughter actually plays squash as well. And she was in France. I said, you are kidding. I said, no. And she said, no, no. She said uh, she was playing uh, uh, in a team in Paris. I said, oh, where, which team? And she was actually my captain. So her daughter that I meet in a hairdresser in Luhold in freaking Spain was actually my, my squash captain in Montmartre Squash Club. Can you believe it? It's a small world, as we say. It is a small world, isn't it? So that's when the show finished. What position did that leave you in, from you know a personal and a professional point of view? Uh, to be very straightforward, it let let me in deep shit. Excuse my English, um, but uh, I just dropped my flat in Paris two weeks before the end of El Dorado. I never believed that El Dorado was going to finish, so I actually let go of my flat in Paris where I paid for it for a whole year. And I said, well, that's it. Now we are settled. I can leave my flat. So when the show finished, I didn't know where to go. And I actually ended up with John Maynard, who was one of the, uh, the script editor for, for, for El Dorado. That became a very good friend. He gave me his bedroom for a little while, you know, and I just actually went to England because well, it sounded a, a good idea at the time. Little I knew that we were like, um, I don't have the word in English, but that like we were marked with a red, you know, iron uh, and that nobody would want us because we were, you know, doomed by El Dorado. People, oh, no, we don't want anybody from El Dorado. It seems very unfair that that's how it was for you. Well, from my point of view, it was because I, I, I know there were some, a few actors at the beginning that were not maybe, you know, the best actors, but we were a lot in there that was very good professionals. And we actually made a show uh, and a 20 minutes per day show, which normally in France, you've got a three, four minutes per day show, you know. So we managed to do something that was actually pretty good with the, the means we had and with a very good crew, uh, with a, some pretty good actors in there and, and branding us bad actors was, I, I believe, extremely unfair. That's my belief. That's my belief. There were some fantastic performances in it, which do, especially w with the passing of time, they seem to get overlooked uh, as people focus on some of the negative things from early in the show. Well, when, when you start something, you know, I was told by the, the creators, you know, Standards, because Tony Holland created Standards with Julia, they told me that Standards at the start was not the best of sorts. And it was given the chance to develop and, you know, and, and grow and, and improve. Uh, and I think that's, that's the problem, is that we were not given the chance to improve and to find our marks. 
Uh, I would like to stress that when we arrived on the set to start the preparations, the set was not built. So imagine how we started shooting. Everything was done at the last minute. The crew had to do wonders, you know, to manage to do. So we, yes, we needed maybe a bit more time, you know, to develop in, in an old style, you know, that would have been, you know, more, more specific of El Dorado. But I, yeah, I think that we needed just a bit more time to establish, you know, like EastEnders, needed two years to actually get to a cruise speed. I was told that, you know, once again, I've got to take people's word for it. But that's what I was told. Since El Dorado, you, you've mentioned that, that you played squash before uh, and squash is very much a, a main focus of your life now, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, basically, I was doing a lot of voiceovers in London uh, and, you know, I was doing quite well. That was one of the major voices in London. But that was giving me a lot of time on my hands, which so I was a bit bored, to be honest. Um, and because I was a squash player and I was a writer in France as well, um, I, for different, you know, connections, I started writing uh, for squash in English. And my sort of different style um, had a little success quite quickly. And very, very, very soon I created my own website with my, my associate, Steve Cubbins. And within two years, we became, you know, the, the leader of of squash reporting because we've got a little bit different attitude to uh, to the reporting. It's not just about the matches. It's about the personalities and the fun of it and what happens behind the scenes. And, you know, so it's a bit more uh, fun to read than just oh, A, B, B in so many points. Now, you mentioned as well that, that you were doing voiceovers in London. Um, yeah. Just to mention some of the brands that you voice commercials for. Oh, Toblerone. For. Toblerone. Yes. Forever. Lose yourself in the Toblerone triangle. Um, you've done some, some car adverts, haven't you? Oh, Peugeot. But my favourite, and one which I remember, I'm, I'm a huge coffee drinker, and I, I only just found out that you were the voice of one of my favourite cups of coffee. Ah oh, oui, Carte Noir et Café Nommé Désir. That's the one. Yes. Oh bless you! No, no, I, I love doing voices. I, I, I am, I'm, I'm very lucky because I've got a voice that can transform themselves and be very, very difficult. You know, so it's, it's. I love doing characters. I love doing uh, cartoons. I love doing voices. I love creating. Um, you know, I've, I've worked on lot on voice for games, video games. I did Metal Gear. Um, and Francoise, thank you so much for your time today. I've thoroughly enjoyed catching up with you. Oh, thank you very much. And, um, you know, if you ha- if you speak with anybody on the show, you know, just say hello from me. <laughs> I've spoken to um, to quite a few already. Um, in fact, uh, Ike, who, who played Javier. Yes. Oh, he's um, lovely. He's a lovely boy. He's a lovely boy. He was very, very gifted. Uh, you know, now he's, 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 a, he's he was a good guy. He's, he's a lovely, lovely, lovely character and very clever. He said lovely things about you as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. He's a lovely, lovely, uh, a very, he was always very keen to learn and very respectful. Uh, uh, you know, I think that is one of the characters that could have been developed, you know, he, he, instead of killing him. Yes. <laughs> He could have developed his character. Just before we close today, do you have um, one favourite memory which, which stands out from your time either on El Dorado or just, just here on the Casa del Sol? It's not just a memory. It's just really uh, a way of life, which was I, I had a great moment. I had, two, uh, um, I had two massages per per week. I had, uh, a, you know, a facial per week. Um, I was playing bridge. I was playing squash. I was doing my job, and my dog was happy, and I was able to feed him. Where in my sometimes in my life I was really starving, so it was just uh, I was I met John Maynard and and you know who's and, and Julia Smith that were amazing amazing people that I miss so much. It was so unfair they died so quickly, and Tony and all the, those people that really were so intelligent, clever, sensitive. They taught me everything about musicals. Um, they, they were wonderful people. I lived some amazing things with them. 
And for that, I will eternally be grateful. Frambois, thank you so much for sharing all those memories and for being so so open and genuine with me today. I've really enjoyed talking to you. You're more than welcome. Speak soon. 93.6 Global Radio's return to El Dorado with Dave James.